You guys will watch this chat, then maybe we'll watch something else, and then, and then we'll do games. You guys, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in a hurry to do, uh, to do games. I mean, I really want to play, I, mean, I have a lot of energy today, I really want to do games. But, um, yeah, man. Go okay, watch this chat. This, this is pretty dark. I'm saying it again, I'm sorry for repeating myself all the time, but, um, you know, these, these are terrible people, man. So, um, yeah. Lauren had told her friends... Lauren had told her friends multiple times that enjoy? she felt someone had been Trigger inside warning. her apartment, and she <laughs> also started getting an eerie vibe when she came back alone, especially late at night. Her. It was as though she could sense something wasn't right, and she even thought about moving multiple times, but unfortunately never went through with it. The reality was that Stephen McDaniel had stolen a master's key from a security guard and let himself into her apartment and looked around on several occasions. He also started filming her when she would GTA, leave and no, return to her apartment during all hours of the day. Had Lauren been in this situation before, or even knew anyone that had, she may have trusted her intuition and unknowingly saved herself from a tragic fate. But that's the key word. Trust. She had no proof of the danger she was in, only conviction, which unfortunately wasn't strong enough when it was most needed. Stephen McDaniel snuck into Lauren's apartment once more, only this time she was sleeping inside. As he crept into her bedroom, she awoke and immediately panicked once she saw the intruder. Jesus. McDaniel then pounced on top of her and proceeded to strangle her for roughly 15 minutes. Lauren put up a courageous fight and clawed at her attacker's Jesus. face and chest, but she was eventually overpowered and died of asphyxiation. After the murder, Stephen dismembered Lauren's body in the bathtub with a hacksaw. He cut his victim into five you guys, other streamers watch this, right? You guys, the, the, uh, yeah, right? Pieces, placed each piece in a trash bag, and then disposed of each of them in Holy separate fuck. trash cans around campus. Three days later, Lauren's concerned friends would arrive at her apartment and let themselves in with a spare key. McDaniel would notice from his window and invited himself inside as he offered to help. All of her belongings were still inside, including her cell phone, driver's license, and passport. A missing persons report was filed that night. A search party commenced the next morning, and police would discover the victim's torso at 9.40 a.m. It oh, was placed not... in a trash can next to the apartment complex. The rest of the victims were... Main police canvassed the surrounding area it's not and began really. conducting it, interviews fine, with neighbors sure. and classmates, one of whom was Stephen McDaniel. But he was first interviewed by the local news, and at the time was unaware that part Boy, of I the think I've seen had been discovered. Um, we're just trying to find out where she is at this point. I mean, no one has seen her since Saturday. I mean, the last time anyone heard from her was an email that she sent out, and... No, not the video, I mean, this... No one's heard from her since. What kind of person was she? I mean, how did you... What did you see? I her? mean, she's as nice as can be. I mean, very personable, very much a people person. Do you know anybody that... Any enemies she might have had? Somebody that might want to hurt her? No, I mean, I mean we, we just don't know where she is. What about um, in the, like, the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of... I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Body? Um, had you heard it? Had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? Right. I mean, we don't know if it's huh? the same person. You know what I mean? Like, they took out a body there earlier. We don't know if it's the same person or not. So that's how we're trying to ask people if they know who lived there. Are you okay, sir? I, I think I need to sit down. Okay. Huh? This is most likely a genuine reaction disguised as another. He is most likely feeling a sense of fear and shock over the fact a substantial piece of evidence has been discovered. Yet he plays it off as a feeling of sorrow over the loss of his supposed friend. I, I don't know anyone that would want to hurt her. She was as nice a person as there is. I, Was she moving soon? This acting, though. Yeah, yeah, she she was going to be moving out uh, today. I, 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 why would anyone do this? Maybe I could have held it. <laughs> I mean, they went in, we looked around the place. Uh, no sign of a struggle, no sign that anyone had broken in. This Just guy. Nothing. He was interviewed by police at 11.50 a.m. You, you, you said he's a decent actor, but... Uh, maybe I'm overanalyzing this, but this is in other videos. Anytime he has to think while he's doing his little acting, you see cracks through it though. You you absolutely do though. 
help in any way he could, yet came across as fidgety and apprehensive the entire time. There were two highlighted moments of the interview. The first was when Stephen asserted that he was a virgin, saving himself for marriage. The second was when the detective discovered scratch marks on his face and it's stomach, hindsight. which he asserted were done by himself in his sleep. He at that point unknown Wait, what? face and stomach, which he asserted were done by himself in his sleep. He at that point unknowingly became the prime suspect and was asked if police could search his apartment. Stephen reluctantly accepted and was then transported back to the complex with four other investigators. While searching his apartment, they discovered a collection of swords, guns, toilet rolls, stockpiled provisions as if he was expecting an apocalyptic event, what? and a mask made out of women's underwear. The most significant discovery, however, was a pack of condoms. Stephen was asked why he would have such an item in his possession if he was staying celibate before marriage, well, at I, which point that's... he miraculously confessed to stealing them from another apartment. This gave the detectives probable cause for arrest oh and Stephen was placed God. in handcuffs and brought back to the police station. His interrogation began just after 11 p.m. Zero head. All right, brother. All right, brother. All right. I just gotta ask you a few more questions. Okay. Uh, you came down earlier tonight, me and you talked, all right. You don't have any weapons on you, do you? No. That's just you are. What's wrong? You know I'm Detective Patterson, right? Yes. Do you remember? Put your hands up here. You remember us talking yes. earlier tonight, right? Yes. You remember me earlier in the day? Yes. When we came down here and talked a little bit and then we left? Yes. Okay. The monotone dialogue and lifeless demeanor you see here. Guys, there's so many escapes out of this argument. I mean, dude. Con condoms, you could use them to, you know, I'm not going to go into details. Here, reportedly but... started on the drive back to the police station. And the suspect's conduct throughout the entire procedure is not only mystifying, but almost impressive. This is one of the most extraordinary pieces of interrogation footage to ever reach the public domain. I need to know about this girl right here. You know her? Yes. Who is that? Lauren Giddings. Does she live next door to you? Yes. When's the last time you seen her? Two or three weeks ago. Okay. That's a, that's a weird tone. Huh? Yes. Look at me when you talk to me, son. Okay? The suspect has morphed himself into this abnormal and extremely creepy character. Whether it's a strategy or some sort question, of mental question, breakdown. Is Do you guys think this, this interrogator uh, is doing this weird act or, or, or is this, this is just his natural way of questioning? Because I feel like the way he's questioning him is very almost like tailored, like just just the uh, the language. It's unclear, but what's incredible is that it somewhat dictates almost the pace of the interrogation. It. The detective has just closed the distance and commanded eye contact, both of which are recognized techniques to increase psychological pressure. Seems naturally Yet thinking. The absurdly haunting manner in which the suspect turns his it head and fixes his too. gaze unnerves the detective to the point where he becomes the one to look away and reset his posture. This essentially never happens in interrogations, as it can give the suspect an incredible boost in confidence. Look at me when you talk to me, son, okay? Was you friends with her? Yes. Close friends? We were good I friends. I mean, y'all were friends, right? Both yes. of y'all were law students. You're studying to be an attorney, right? Yes. What kind of law do you want to go into? Criminal law? Yes. Civil? Is that what you want to do for a living? Yes. Okay. The detective steps back from his initially aggressive strategy. He asks trivial questions for 35 seconds before attempting to ramp up the pressure in a more subtle manner. And you've lived next to Lauren for a long time? Yes. Okay. Do you know where she's at tonight? No. Hmm? No. Have you ever seen her with that dress on? No. You have no idea where she's at? No. Huh? Yes. <laughs> what? Look. Just tell me what happened, brother. I don't know. Well, where's she at? I need you. I'm asking you for your help. I'm a detective, and I'm asking you for your help. Can you help me? Help me, brother. What do you mean you don't know? You can't help a friend out? I don't know what you need. I need to know where Lauren's at. I don't know. Do you even care that no one can find her? 
Yes. What's going on with this guy? I mean, I don't know, do you? Yes. Okay, you can say it's an act, but this guy has lasted the longest of all the other suspects in other videos so far. What's up with a pair of underwear that was in your apartment? It was like a mask. It was cut out like a mask. Do you, you cut underwear out that look like a mask? No. Are you a knife collector or a knife person? Or No. You just like knives? I used to collect swords. I mean, do you know your swords? Yes. I mean, to sell and trade swords? No. Is that how Lauren looked with the long hair the last time you seen her? Yes. Or she got, that's how she looks? This yes. is an NPC. I mean, earlier today, me and you sit here and talk normal. What's going on with you now? Why are you acting like this? I need to know. Ooh, okay. Confrontational. Why are you acting like this? Okay. Uh oh. Earlier today we sat here and talked. But now you're acting like you don't know what's going on. Hmm? Huh? I mean, did something happen or something? Dude, he's bugging. I mean, why are you not, why are you shutting down? Why are you not talking to me? I don't know. You don't know? Are you scared? No. I mean, you're not scared, are you? No. Stephen's demeanor doesn't waver for the first 20 minutes, so the detective eventually takes a more distinctly aggressive approach. He attacks the subject's you know character down? to see if it might coax him out of the act and into defending his dignity. You got your ass on that fucking news and stood out there and gave a media report that her mother saw about her missing daughter. And you want me to sit there and tell him that you don't know? Uh oh. Is that what you want me to tell him? Because you're all over the news. You sure stood out there and ran your mouth to the news media. But now you're going to get out here and you don't fucking know. Who did? You know. The detective's a weird character. You're just a sorry piece of shit that don't give a fuck. This guy did interesting. Right. Yeah. Well, why'd you tell the media everything? Do you need to see what you told the media right. today? Yes. It was on the 11 o'clock news. Well, I'm asking you. Tell me. I want to know. I don't know where she is. That ain't what you told the media. You didn't stand in front of that camera and say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I wonder if he's doing this act, the NPC thing, because it's like a, it's like an easy act to to keep up with. I need you to tell me what you want me to tell her mother, and then I won't ask you another thing. I'm not gonna tell her mother that you don't know. It's not she elaborate. Saw you on the news tonight, and she cried all the way down to Macon because you had the balls to get on the news and tell everybody everything. Recap so far. I'll do so recap in five minutes. Right now. Ain't working with me. Okay. So you need to snap out of it and tell me what the hell happened. So we can move on. I don't know. Well, how many times you gonna say I don't know? Hmm? Huh? How many times you gonna say it? If you did something, that you regret. Oh. You let me know. I didn't. Well, who did? I don't know. Whether it was that planned was the first or not, time that the second detective says... enters the room with a similar strategy of immediate aggression. Rapport development seems to have been collectively thrown by the wayside. What's up, man? Did you talk to him about his guns? Yeah. When was the last time you shot those guns? You've never shot a gun? No. Have you ever shot any gun in your whole life? No. Never? No. Huh? So you bought three guns that you've never shot? Yes. 
Why? To have. <laughs> for what? To have. For what? I'm asking for what? Why? Why do you want to have for them? What? what makes? Did they why? Give you, I mean, tell for me what? why it's important to you to have three guns. That's an easy question. Come on, talk to me, buddy. Me and you talked all day today. We ain't had a problem communicating. Why is it important for you to have three guns? Do you not know? No. You say you don't know where Lauren is, right? Right. You said you told me earlier you and Lauren were friends, right? Yes. How how would you describe y'all's relationship? She was my friend. She was your friend. <laughs> what this guy did? Did you ever do things for her? Did she ever do things for you? What did she ever do for you? We talked. What did y'all talk about? News. The news? The news? Come on, man. How many times have you been in her apartment with her hanging out? You don't know? If you had to guess, what would you... I mean, this guy just one left. time, yeah, two he times, just left. three times what? Maybe two. See, if I had only been somewhere twice, I could remember that. If I had been there over 50 times and you asked me how many times I've been, like, I don't know a lot. But the fact that you've only been there twice, when I say how many times you've been there, you say you don't know, that's just odd to me. Does that make sense to you? Okay. That does make sense. No, well, so what I'm saying right now makes sense. a good argument. No. I don't think it's going to break him, though. Lauren's missing. This, this pretty little girl right here, your neighbor, she's missing. Much like Detective 1, Detective 2 now valiantly moves in for the psychological charge. He closes the distance and locks eye contact. His physical demeanor, alongside a prolonged gaze, will hopefully crack the suspect's fortified barrier. Once broken, the momentum will commence and the suspect will be more likely to divulge incriminating information. All the detective has to do is maintain eye contact for longer than his adversary. It's a psychological battle of attrition between two opposing forces, and these moments can sometimes last for minutes on end. Also, I know they've already said this in other, in, the, in, in other episodes, but the positioning is very important here. This guy, I'm pretty sure he's, he's squeezed in. See, he's, he's all the way on his own, right? And he's trapped to the wall, and his positioning is squeezing him, and, and that has like a psychological effect on him, dude. Me and you both know it's no different than when you Maybe was a little feel kid, trapped. right? And you reached in that cookie jar and you got caught after your mama told you not to get that cookie. And when she was, did you get a cookie? No. And whenever you tell a lie, you feel bad about it right then. One, with every lie, there's a chance you're going to get caught. And that weighs on you. Because you know you did something bad. Am I right? I didn't do it. You didn't take the cookie? No. What? It smells like you've been cleaning up, like you've been using cleaner to clean up. I know what that smells like. My wife smells like that all the time when she cleans the house. Ooh. You've been using some kind of cleaner to clean up your apartment, haven't you? No. Steven, you telling me you live with, like a maid? How does your apartment get clean? I clean it. When was the last time you cleaned it, Steven? I don't remember. Was it this week? No. You mean you go a whole week without cleaning? Yes. Why? That's horrible, Steve. A week? That's it? I don't know how else to say it, Steven. A week? Tell a week? What I think. I think that she was a friend of yours. This is some rookie Look numbers, right man. I think that she was a friend of yours. And I think something happened, Steven. You used to watch her come in and out of her apartment, didn't you? No. Well, how y'all doing? We're just talking. 
Okay. TLDR is like, it's like some stalker weird dude and his neighbor, there's a girl and uh, and then uh, he, he snuck into her apartment and he strangled her and then chop chop. And um, then, he, then he went on the news and, and said, it said, said some bullshit. And also the reason why they can hold him is that he confessed to um, stealing condoms um, of all things. Otherwise, he, I, I don't think he was, he was gonna Pretty girl right there. Stay there. Yes. You telling me you look at a pretty girl like that and you never once thought ever? Stealing condoms as somebody who is uh, keeping his uh, virginity for marriage or whatnot. Man. She looks good. You never thought that? I don't understand. <laughs> what do you mean you don't understand? Did you know how when you're sitting there you see a girl walking down the road? And you say, man, that girl looks good. You ever see a good looking girl on the road? You think guys, slow down, guys. This is a private conversation, and it's a detective. He He's trying to solve a murder case by somebody, somebody who died. He can use any taxes that he can to, to his availability, whether you think it's weird or not. To get this guy to, get, to, to justice, that's what the... the, the, the dude. To, get, to, to give the family closure and shit. It's, it's, uh, motherfucker, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Fuck's wrong with you? You never thought that about her? Yes. So, you mean to tell me you look at porn on the internet and get off to that, but you never looked at her and said, man, I wonder what it'd be like to have sex with her? Yes. You have? No. Steven, this is hard, buddy. I know this is hard. And I can tell it's only you want to let it go. There's blood in your apartment, Stephen. You didn't get it all up. This is the widely recognized futility technique, which is used to make the subject believe it is useless to resist due to the overwhelming evidence against them. It's most effective when the interrogator can play on doubts that already exist in the subject's mind. The only problem here is that Stephen didn't dismember Lauren inside his apartment. It all happened in Lauren's apartment, so the detective's bluff is already called at this point. Oh my... It didn't all come off! You scrubbed and you wiped! But we can tell that! Don't you watch CSI? Yeah, we know it! Stephen! CSI? Why is there really? blood in your bathroom? The detective now completely shifts his strategy from confrontational and aggressive to sympathetic and understanding. He attempts to create a connection and then afford Stephen a more socially acceptable reason for the crime. This is extremely difficult to pull off after a direct confrontation, as there is no established rapport nor trust. The usual routine is the exact that opposite. Felt that. You would first build rapport and then get aggressive once a connection has been attained. I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell it. I wanted to be here with you to go through that process because I know you're not a monster, man. I know you're not a bad guy. Right. You're just a hard-working student trying to pass a bar exam, ain't you? You ain't got a lot of support from your family, do you? Yes. You do? The strategy fails at the first hurdle. Stephen immediately shuts down the afforded sympathy and reasoning behind the alleged Jeez. crime, which was the concept of unsupportive parents. But the detective now attempts to roll with it. A lot of people can't say that. And the fact that you do have support from your family should make the things easier. Because your family wants to feel like they've raised somebody that tells the truth and is honest, right? Yes. Have you heard okay. that girl, Stephen? No. Have you ever heard anyone, Stephen? No. You've never heard anyone? No. I've heard people, Stephen. I've made mistakes in my life. It's not even normal to say you've never heard anybody. Sometimes oh, no, this, this guy, please. They say things they don't mean to say. It hurts. He never kicked a dog or a cat. The lead detective then asks non-confrontational questions for almost 30 minutes, which is most likely to see if it will change the suspect's demeanor and the manner in which he responds. But it doesn't. Stephen maintains the same lifeless disposition which he has now kept up for almost yeah, 90 minutes. Yeah, this is an easy act, no shit. You know what's crazy? I was talking to people that he works with and everything, they talk about how 
He's yeah. always expresses himself. Uh, he don't know. He's very talkative. Dude, no, it's not so the, talkative, listen, buddy. The, the other episodes, the, the, they have elaborate schemes of how they want to act, and they all crack within fucking 20 minutes, dude. You or even so a minute friendly, in. You're you stop in and say hello, and you talk. What, why is it that you're acting it's so It's not easy, it's more tonight? simple, I, I meant. If you, if you have all this character and personality about you, why is it that everything that we get from you is yes, no, or I don't know? I don't know. Why are you acting like this, Stephen? You see how I'm able to talk in complete sentences? Like we're having a conversation, but the only thing you're bringing to the table is a yes, no, or I don't know. Stephen, did you hurt that girl? No. Would you tell me if you did? Yes. And you lied um, to me at all in this interview? No. Yes, you have, Stephen. When was the last time you did laundry? Ooh. A few weeks ago. What? You ain't washed clothes in a few weeks? Yeah. Why? Who would do something like that? A lot of clothes. No, you don't. That's another lie. You don't have a lot of clothes. Yes, I do. Nope. You got enough underwear to last you three weeks? Yes. Do you wear the same pair of underwear more than one day? Yes. Why? Because it's still clean enough to wear. Where's that little girl, Stephen? I don't know. Stephen, you know! You know, look at this right here, this little girl right here. I've worn the same pants for fucking six weeks now. Know? Who gives a fuck? I know you know. I don't know. Yes, you know. What are you going to say tomorrow when I say we got your hair with the body? What are you going to say to me then? Because you know, like, I go like that. Because you wear, you wear underwear. Oh. Look at my hair. That's how easy it falls out. Look at all that on your head. You don't think nothing fell out? It did. We just wanted to give you an opportunity to tell it. So you didn't look like a monster at the end. Because you know what? I don't believe that you're a monster, Steven. I uh, believe that you're a good guy. You've been picked on. Girls didn't show you the respect that you deserved. You did something stupid. And I believe you feel bad about it. And that's why you're all freaked out right now. But I'm giving you the opportunity to get right. I'm giving you an opportunity to show everybody you're not but he, a monster. But he said he already went into the department before. you feel bad about what happened. Your hair is there, man. Yeah, that could explain it, though. That's Your not... hair is there. That's right, buddy. See that? Look at it. See how easy? What's happening? See this stuff right here? Your hair? Yeah, it fell out of your head when you was moving the body, Steven. That's right. Do you remember moving the body? No. Yes, you do, Steven. Why, man? Why? Tell me, bud. I didn't do it. Yes, you did, Steven. We want you to, to tell it so that way people are understand you're not a monster. Things just, you got out of control. It's a sickness. I wonder how much touch are allowed. Why'd you do it, Steven? Steven, why are you going to keep telling that? You hurt that girl. No, I didn't. Yes, you did, Steven. You hurt her, man. She was screaming. Screaming, Steven. Why? And I know you feel bad about it. Psycho. I can see it in your face. What came over you, man? What happened, Steven? I don't know. I know you don't know. You can't, you couldn't control it, could you? I didn't do it. Steven! They steal your hair and take it over there? They didn't, did they? That's right. It's all sinking in right now. He knows is what you're thinking. Steven, I don't want no. it to be a game between me and you. I know it hurts. Yeah, why is it so hard to crack it? person and you want to tell it. Your hair was there, Steven. We've all known it all along. 
We wanted just to give you an opportunity to tell what happened. Did y'all have sex? No. Did you try to have sex? No. Did you think about having sex? No. Liar. Damn, Sid. What kind of man doesn't think about having sex? Really consistent, too. You said earlier you like girls, right? Yes. You said she's a pretty girl, right? Yes. What'd you do to her, Stephen? I didn't do anything. You're lying. You hurt that girl. No, I didn't. Sure it did, and that's why you're having this massive meltdown right now. The detective quite literally repeats the phrase, you hurt that girl, to which Stephen responds, no I didn't, and this goes on for the best part of 20 minutes. Perhaps the detective's strategy was to induce mental exhaustion, yet it had no effect whatsoever. Not effective. Why'd you hurt that girl? That's what I thought they were going to do earlier. They were going to tire him out. Why'd you hurt her, Stephen? I didn't. You hurt her, Stephen. No, I didn't. Then you did. Take this from me. You don't deserve to look at it. Just stay right here, okay? Okay. I appreciate all your cooperation tonight, okay? Okay. Really? That that's the I don't know. Guy, guys, guys, I'm not, I'm not a detective, guys. I'm a fuck, guys. I'm a bum dropout, okay? I don't get right, to we'll second guess their their analysis, their, their conduct or whatever. The lead detective now abandons the pursuit of any sort of admission. He instead proceeds to belittle and humiliate the suspect as much as possible. It may have a tactical purpose, but it's more likely out of frustration, alongside the fact he is certain of the suspect's culpability. Where you, you, I know earlier today you told me you stayed home all weekend, right? In your apartment? Yes. Did anybody see you? Did you talk to anybody over the weekend? Were you on your computer all weekend? Is there anything I can look at that um, I can say he couldn't be involved because he was on the computer? Or he was online on a porn site or... Okay. He was online doing college work or anything that would exclude you as being involved altogether. I mean, did anybody see you this weekend at the house? Did you go out to get a newspaper? Did you uh, wave to a neighbor or just locked yourself in all week? Yes. Nobody saw you? No. I mean, what, do you just stay in the house all day? Yes. I mean, what do you do all day in idols? I mean, you've always done that your whole life? You don't have no friends? I have How can you friends. go your whole life without a friend? I have friends. Where they at? Jeez. Hmm? Huh? Where they at? Oh. Do you have any friends here in Macon? Yes. Name one, because everybody I talked to said they ain't your friend. Ryan Granger. Cass Lawson, Ashley Morehouse, Carmen uh, Love. That's the same people I talked to today, and they're not your friend. Okay. One of the reasons interrogations are so fascinating is the ethical vacuum it creates for everyone inside its bubble. In any other circumstance, the detective's behavior here would be considered cruel and yep. reprehensible. He's essentially bullying the suspect, yet the empathy we would normally have is now stripped away through the impression of retribution. We know this person has done something horrific, and the treatment he is now receiving is merited through his own actions. Very much your friend. I mean, it's all over anyways. I just want to know what was going on tonight. So that's why I hate when people give detectives like too much shit for some of it. Over. I mean, we know what you did to her, so we just want to know what you, if you were going to tell us or not. I didn't do anything. Um, mm-hmm, sure did. That's what you say. But we know different, so you're fucked either way. You're fucked. We How about a Herman Miller chair? We know you killed her. We know you put her body in the trash can. The news media knows it. Glenda knows it. Your mother. This is a health hazard. Your sister knows it. 
your sister's husband knows it. The one that used to beat your sister. He knows it. You know what he said? He said he's a crazy motherfucker is what he said. When I called him. That's your own family calling you crazy. Nobody wants to see you. Nobody's coming to visit you. Jeez. So you can sit there with that dumb He's not he's face. not gonna crack. But it's over. No shot. The entire interrogation took over two hours. When sped up by 20,000%, you truly get a glimpse of how remarkable the suspect's catatonic performance was. Jeez. I made the HD Andy. Absolutely no shot. His mother came to speak with him soon after this moment, and although he maintained his innocence, he immediately snapped out of the zombie-like character. It's difficult to interpret the reasoning behind the performance, whether it was a pre-planned strategy, improvised in the moment, or some type of psychological breakdown is unclear. But whatever it was, it evidently seemed to work, as the interrogators got nothing. The suspect's behavior was so abnormal, they were essentially at a loss with what to do, or where to even start with a specific plan of attack. The evidence, however, was irrefutable. Ooh. Hundreds of pictures of Lauren were discovered on Stephen's flash drive, along with multiple video recordings of inside her apartment. A hacksaw was found in a supply closet of the apartment complex, and it was marked red with what was later identified as Lauren's blood through DNA testing. The packaging for the exact same hacksaw was found in Stephen's apartment. When confronted with the evidence, he took a plea deal to avoid the death penalty and was rendered a life sentence without the possibility of parole. He is currently Fuck being held it. at the high-security Hancock State Prison in Sparta, Georgia. One of the more discussed elements to the present day is the motive behind the crime. What was the reasoning behind Stephen's actions that night? He asserts that murder was never his intention, but simply the result of momentary panic and confusion, all preceded by the foolish decision to break into an apartment, which stemmed from a potent yet harmless infatuation with a girl he found attractive. He essentially tried to make out that his behavior was devious and calculating, but not evil or perverted. Public opinion on the matter varies, yet the general consensus is Public that the opinion. murder was premeditated, mainly due to the fact that he had bought the hacksaw just days prior to the murder. A popular psychological viewpoint takes us back to the personality of a stalker. Lauren was set to move out the very same day she was murdered, which brings some to believe that Stephen was terrified by the notion of change, that the person he had been infatuated with and fantasized over for so long was no longer going to be a part of his life. And no matter how obscure and unreciprocated their association was, he couldn't bear the thought of losing her. Rather than Jesus. Lauren going on to live the promising life that lay ahead of her and leaving Stephen behind as a forgotten memory, he has now in some well, abstract manner talking. connected them both forever. Well, that's incredibly unsettling. Good to be back. Hope you're doing well. This is the sixth and final installment guys, of my who is this guy? McDaniels commentary. Man, it's been a slog. We are deep in the troll vortex of insanity. I don't think anyone's gone this far. It's like cave diving, but a lot more dangerous. There's a research and a script. It's a shout out. He writes episodes. Okay. Interesting. 